All right, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Very nice talk. And I'm going to talk about a topic um, that I'm sure you all see every day, diminished ovarian reserve. And there's lots of pathways into this topic. I'm going to focus primarily on the infertility side today um, and talk a little bit about the overlap between what we formally call premature ovarian insufficiency and diminished ovarian reserve and then early perimenopause. So to some extent we can overlap these conditions, um, but I want to talk about first of all the physiology of perimenopause and the changing hormone secretion patterns with ovarian aging and explain a little bit about the links and explore some of the options. This is a really big amount of information, so I've just taken a little slice of it. So when we talk about diminished ovarian reserve, it's usually in the context of infertility. And it's used to describe women who have an unexpectedly low ankle follicle count or a poor response to stimulation or a low AMH. And perimenopause is when you're dealing with the menopause world, they like that phrase, or the menopausal transition. And so that references another whole body of information around hormone use. It generally refers to the age range 40 to 55, lots of different words for this, and increasingly we are using menopausal transition. And then we have premature ovarian insufficiency, it used to be called premature menopause, but we no longer like that term. So it's the premature onset of perimenopause um, or premature diminished ovarian reserve. And then menopause, that's the one that hasn't changed. So that's still the same, same word, um, and the same reference to the same concept, which is uh, no longer ovulating any of the follicles that might reside in the ovary. So the timing of this is really critical. We expect menopause at a certain age, and when it comes early, it's early menopause, and when it comes very early, we call it premature. And we often think of this primarily as just a variant, but there is a big influence of the CNS. So we showed years ago that stressed women in their 50s didn't have elevated LH and FSH, even though they were menopausal. And they actually had a worse cardiovascular picture than the ones that were menopausal. Um, and they had stress-induced suppression of gonadotropin secretion. And you really can't tell someone has diminished ovarian reserve if their hypothalamic pituitary function isn't fully on. And so I study the group that isn't fully on most of the time. So AMH might not be so relevant in that group. And that's part of the complexity that we contend with in our office when someone comes in with menstrual cycle irregularities. Do they have a fully intact hypothalamic pituitary function? Or is it partly off? And should we actually try to understand what's going on from the lens of the gene range? Uh, dry, or should we go first to the ovary? When we go to the ovary, then you know we understand all of what normally happens in the ovary is for LH and FSH when they're at the right levels to drive folliculogenesis as we expect it with the appropriate hormone outputs. And I think you know for years we all understand this very very well, better than everybody else in terms of looking at what is needed for FSH to initiate folliculogenesis and to have feedback to the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And we know under conditions of stress that the feedback sensitivity is lower for estradiol, and so it doesn't take much to turn off the HP axis when cortisol levels are high. What we often fail to recognize are the um, unusual patterns of ovarian folliculogenesis in women with perimenopause. And so, Although the hypothalamic pituitary unit changes in terms of feedback sensitivity and does become less sensitive to feedback across time, what we often don't think about is the follicle itself doesn't respond to hormones like gonadotropins in the same way across time. And so there are two phrases that I think are easy to remember. One is loop, which refers to a luteal autophase follicular event. 
So for years I worked with the Ernst Nobile group that studied GnRH. And to understand the HPO, they hired an ovarian physiologist, Tony Celestic. And he did important seminal studies in monkeys, giving gonadotropins in the luteal phase to demonstrate that even in the presence of progesterone, you could get folliculogenesis. That's not news to us now. We use this in onco fertility every day, but at the time, people really didn't understand that the reason follicles didn't develop in the luteal phase was that gonadotropins were not high enough. Well, if they are high enough, you will get follicular events in the luteal phase. And it can be very confusing in an infertility context because we are often thinking of the menstrual cycle as an on-off switch. And now I'm introducing the concept that it's not an on-off switch, it's more like a rheostat. And then we have the uh, concept of lag cycles. So I will go through what a lag cycle is in just a minute, but um, it's obviously been something we've struggled with for a long time, and I just like to have a name for it. So we all know that you're born with all the follicles you're ever gonna get, that they age, that the number of follicles and the rate at which they age is variable from individual to individual. And for a long time, almost 40 years, and we've now been able to show that there's a huge range in follicle number. And the most recent study by Whitcomb showed that early menarche, shorter menstrual cycle interval, lower AMH predicts earlier menopause. So we have the ability to look at this, maybe not as precisely as we would like, but we're beginning to make a story for using AMH as a good surrogate marker for follicle number. And AMH is better than inhibit B or FSH because it's partly a reflection of the pre uh, or gonadotropin independent phase of follicular development. And we know that the gonadotropin independent phase isn't completely independent, but it's less dependent on preceding gonadotropin exposure. So this is a wonderful slide from a very large database in China, just looking at follicle or AMH levels um, in cohorts. So you can see actually the peak of AMH is in adolescence, not at birth. So those follicles that we're looking at that are in the ovary aren't making AMH initially, so you have to have a little gonadotropin stimulation, and then it declines across time. But the other major reason for showing this slide is to show the huge range in AMH. So I just came from the Endocrine Society where I was talking about premature ovarian insufficiency, not diminished ovarian reserve, because at the Endocrine Society, they don't care about diminished ovarian reserve, they care about premature ovarian insufficiency. So, but these are same phrases for the same concept, different phrases for the same concept. And we are seeing a lot of diminished ovarian reserve in our oncofertility patients. And the party line right now is they don't stimulate well. So the question is, why do they not stimulate well? Is it the oncologic process they're facing? Is it the stress of, of being sick? Or is there something else going on? We also know that there are environmental causes of accelerated attrition. We don't know all of them, but tobacco and alcohol are two. And then there are genetic causes and autoimmune causes and metabolic causes. So there are lots of causes that would explain why some women have more follicles than others, even from the beginning, or why they have greater rates of atresia and follicle loss. So when we do a laboratory evaluation, we often do the laboratory panel that's shown here. Now, in the OBGYN world, everyone argues about thyroid peroxidase antibodies. No one at the Endocrine Society would ever argue about getting thyroid peroxidase antibodies. They routinely get them, and if you didn't, you'd flunk the exam. So you just speak to two worlds, and they see the autoimmunity perhaps as more um, prevalent than we do. Um, when you look at additional testing, that's when you get into a lot of controversy, but most endocrinologists will always order anti-adrenal antibodies um, they want to detect adrenal insufficiency. Most of them are ordering FMR1 and a karyotype, and I don't know if we do that here in Egypt. Um, we don't do it routinely in the US, I don't think, at least not in our center, and an ovarian ultrasound. 
So all of this thing established the state of the variable reserve and to determine if someone has a cause for accelerated egg loss. What's interesting, and this is just from 2015 and actually been updated recently, is there are in the range of 60 to 80 known genetic loci that determine follicle number or rates of attrition. And half of those, roughly, are DNA repair enzyme variants. And they may actually be the kind of variants that were shown on the previous slide, um, where they are um, basically DNA repair enzymes like BRCA1 and BRCA2. So some individuals will have a, a no genetic disorder that we've described, but some will have uh, alterations in DNA repair enzymes that not only predispose to earlier menopause or diminished ovarian reserve, but also predispose to an oncologic process and a known cancer. So in this population of PLI slash DR are people with autoimmunity, people with oncogenes, and individuals like what I'm going to describe now, fragile X syndrome. And the question is, are we screening for these and do we know what to do if we find a positive? So FMR1 is a chromosomal abnormality on the long arm of X. And when you get a loss of function, you get a syndrome. So if it's in boys, you get um, a diminishment of intelligence, and it's a leading single gene defect associated with autism. In women, it actually translates into low ovarian reserve. And the number of repeats in the FMR gene actually uh, signal how disruptive the gene function will be. And so you see uh, that when there's a normal set of repeats in the gene, the yellow area, then you get a normal gene product. When you get a premutation and an expansion of the repeats, the gene product is still made, but it doesn't work as well. And if you get more than 200 repeats in this same gene, the gene doesn't get made, the product doesn't get made. So then you have fragile X syndrome that's full blown. And almost always women are silent carriers, except for the presence of diminished ovarian reserve. So as they age, women with FMR1 uh, premutations also acquire other kinds of things, such as cognitive decline, peripheral neuropathy, and neurological disorders. So in our population of premature ovarian insufficiency or diminished ovarian reserve are people with real disease. And this is just a slide of the ovarian um, age at menopause according to the number of repeats. So this was another review article um, that I would like to recommend. It's, I'm not trying to go through all of it, but it was a large study done looking at AIR, which is another gene product that specifies autoimmunity. And a lot of patients with premature ovarian insufficiency present with autoimmune conditions. The question is, do they have a known gene defect that we can detect? And so there's a whole set of criteria for looking for this gene. Most endocrinologists follow this um, pathway here, looking for no mutation, two mutations, and a dominant negative uh, mutation in the AIR gene that specifies a type of autoimmune constellation. So keeping that in mind, as you're running out of eggs, what happens to hormones? And I think the cartoon most people carry in their head is as the follicle number declines, the estradiol level declines. It's a very nice, convenient cartoon, just happens not to be true. So what really happens, I think, is best illustrated by this slide. This is someone I did my fellowship with. So you can see this is um, older and younger women with regular cycles. The older women have shorter cycles, um, and that's in a population-based study normative. But what you see is if you standardize according to the LH surge, they are missing about five to seven days. And what's interesting for, um, so these are daily gonadotropins, estradiol in the urine, and PGD, which is the surrogate for progesterone in the urine. And what you can see is um, as women age towards the middle of their luteal phase, they start to have an elevation of FSH. 
that starts to recruit the next follicle. And what's interesting, even though the progesterone levels are lower in the older women, the estradiol levels are lower. So this isn't fully explained by recruiting more than one follicle, because if they recruited two or three follicles, you'd expect to have not only more estradiol, but also more progesterone. So per increment of estradiol, they have actually a decrement in progesterone. And all of this is relatively clinically silent. People will come in and tell you they have normal menstrual periods, but they're probably having premature um, recruitment of follicles in the luteal phase. That's the loop event, luteal out of phase follicular event. And then the next thing that happens is you get lag cycles. And this is a very old slide. I use it because it's old. And I like to emphasize that we've known this forever. We just haven't really thought about it very much. So this is a 46-year-old woman, four menstrual cycles in a year. And these are FSH levels, different assay. These are estradiol levels, and these are progesterone levels. So four menstrual bleeds, only one of which was ovulatory based on progesterone. And the estradiol levels and the cycles that were anovulatory are much higher. So they're getting hormone crashes, even though they are still having normal menstrual periods. So that's shown here. So AMH is about the best we have for hormone detection. A lot of people like to do antifollicle count. That's also can be very useful to use those both together. But FSH or estradiol alone is not so good for predicting menopause timing or for determining if someone has diminished ovarian reserve simply because the cartoon we carry in our head about menstrual cycles isn't the same cartoon in older women. So antigen levels do not change. This is final menstrual period zero where the red line is, and these are antigen levels. This is Henry Berger's review from a few years ago. Pretty good paper, I recommend it as well. And the bad news is all of these loop and lag cycles are in our infertility population, and they don't know they are having diminished ovarian reserve, they don't know they're having early perimenopause, and sometimes we don't know it either unless we look for it. And so we will give our standard doses and not understand why we don't have standard responses. So when is the initial age at which people start to show these kinds of hormonal changes? So it'll be as early as 20s, but mostly it starts in the 30s, early 30s. And that's normative data. So in diminished ovarian reserve, women with POI, this might start in their teens or their early 20s. And it's that mixed in our normal population because we're not really thinking about it as a gene variant that specifies low follicle number. And when you have irregular cycles, you not only have to think of all the causes of ovarian dysfunction, you have to think of all the other causes, including all the gynecologic causes. So in essence, we are practicing gynecology before we can practice infertility care. We have to know what we're dealing with. We have to rule out a bunch of other kinds of things because the symptomatology in the patients, other than infertility, may actually lead us to think about these autoimmune causes of uh, depleted ovarian follicle number. So to me, the way I think about this is the therapeutic aims in diminished ovarian reserve are one to predict the reserve, and then to diagnose possible etiologies of low reserve when you find it. And that's actually a pretty big step. And then you want to know if they have a cancer risk. Do they have a gene mutation that has specified both low ovarian reserve and a risk of cancer? And then you come to fertility management. So you, if you have an autoimmune condition, you don't want to start treating someone for their infertility without correcting their autoimmunity. It's not good to be pregnant with diminished adrenal function. It's not good to be pregnant and have autoimmune thyroiditis. So it's also possible that as we learn more about the causes of DOR, um, that we would be able to do PGT for the embryos and select those. So we do this now for BRCA, right? We know someone's a BRCA carrier, and we usually screen the embryos for BRCA, at least we do in the US, and so that the next generation doesn't carry the BRCA mutation. We've started to use oncofertility stimulation protocols for our POI patients and probably for our DOR patients, and 
that would mean that we have to kind of think of them all in the same category as not really being able to respond in a normal fashion. And our categorization of cycles into discrete units will be very different. So for oncofertility protocols, we take them as they come at any time in their menstrual cycle. We start the gonadotropins, and we sometimes do what we call do a stim. We do a retrieval and keep the gonadotropins going, and then do the next stimulation and retrieval so that they can get their eggs retrieved as soon as possible. So we may use that kind of protocol thinking for DOR as well. And the whole question for those who are not facing an oncologic deadline of needing to take chemo or radiation therapy is whether we do ovarian suppression ahead of time to try to kind of get rid of the loop and lag cycles and have a fresh initiation of a stem cycle and whether that will help or not. And then, of course, we have the issue of egg donation. And for those who are not interested in fertility, there's a whole ocean amount of information around hormone management for symptoms and contraception. So this is a giant amount of work to see these patients and to do a really complete job of evaluating them. So just in summary, the clinical presentation of diminished ovarian reserve overlaps with premature ovarian insufficiency, what we sometimes call perimenopause, and the um, timing of the menopausal transition is highly variable just because um, the egg quality and quantity is highly variable. And the symptoms reflect tissue responses um, in various tissues. So my favorite tissue to talk about is the brain, but I omitted it completely here because for the sake of time, but there are lots of brain consequences of fluctuating hormones and lots of brain consequences from low hormones. But the clinical approach to DOR really depends on the clinical objectives of the patient and the symptomatology. And so in the context of infertility, I think DOR is still a very good phrase to use as long as it triggers in our minds a search for other causes, including autoimmunity, FMR, and perhaps BRCA or other oncogenes. So once we know the other concomitants that are coming with this patient, then I think we can do a better care holistically, not only for infertility, but of her. And I think failure to recognize DOR may lead to inappropriate fertility interventions, including using gonadotropins in someone with high gonadotropins or starting gonadotropins at the wrong time because they're having a loop or lag cycle. So questions. Should we screen for DOR, POI with AMH, and if so, at what age? What about 20, 15? Can I sell you 10? You know, I think we have to decide when the right time to screen. I heard earlier that 38 is too late, and I think that that is possibly, you know, too late for many. It would be too late for women with PLI. Should we screen for uh, genes found to contribute to DOI that are also cancer genes? And should we res be res routinely screening the embryos of these patients? And more pie in the sky, or as we call it now, blue sky, thinking, could we reverse the OR, extend fertility by identifying the genes that regulate the cytoretresia and or DNA repair? So it's a hot topic. Um, I don't have answers to these questions, but I just wanted to um, put them out there to see what kinds of responses you might have. And, and then thank you again for, me, for inviting us here. It's been an absolute pleasure.